listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to look back on this somber anniversary, 22 years since the events of 9-11-2001, September 11th, the day that this gateway ritual changed the world in immeasurable ways. It's a different era since that time. Some would say the dawning of a new age. And since that time, we've now had some other things come about that tend to leverage on the occult archetypes that were instituted on that fateful day in 2001, 9-11. And we've explored some of the occult aspects of this here in the past, and we're going to continue to delve a little further down the trail... And the inspiration for this came to me as I was searching through and thinking about that day back in 2001. And I came across some old pictures on the internet that I remember from that time that were all over the front pages of the newspapers. Especially the New York newspapers. And one of those pictures that was forever emblazoned in my mind is actually the thumbnail image for this episode... A picture of the face of what people deemed to be the devil in the smoke burning in that photograph on that day. Now, was this a real manifestation of a thing? Or was this photoshopped? And I think there's been some controversy about this for a very long time. Because around that time, that's when we started to begin to see photoshopped pictures began to circulate. Now, this was... Still, in the somewhat early days of the internet and of software tools for manipulating photos, but you also remember there was a photo that, at that time, became very popular in newspapers and tabloids and things like that, that was broadly distributed. It was a picture of a a guy standing on the top, the rooftop of, allegedly, the World Trade Center, and he was kind of taking a selfie, or he had a photo taken of him, and in the background... Approaching rather closely to the building, you could see an airplane right behind him. These are iconic photographs associated with that day. If you were around at that time and you remember, you'll know exactly which photographs I'm talking about here. So thinking about these things, and knowing the things I know now in hindsight here, 22 years later, I'm looking back and wondering... How advanced were the photoshopping tools and stuff in that day? Because that one, the one of the the guy standing on the building with the airplane behind him, was later exposed to be a fraud. But this one with the devil's face in the tower, I think was still one that was considered legitimate. So that being the case, who knows what really happened here. So much of this, so much of this, is shrouded in mystery and on purpose, that we have to wonder what all was behind it. There was a lot of orchestrating behind these things that happened on that day. So at any rate, regardless of what your stance is on that day, the events of that day forever changed our world in innumerable ways, as I said earlier here. And we need to go back and have a look at some of the details. Because the devil is in the details, and quite literally in this case, because there's his face on the tower. Is this the devil, though? Or is this face represented in the smoke of the explosion on the tower in that famous photograph? Does it represent something else? And we're going to touch on these angles of things tonight. And we're going to dig deep into the occult for this one. We're going to touch on those aspects of it that so few are willing to actually talk about. There's plenty of people that talk about the political side of all of this. The monetary interests involved in this, like Larry Silverstein, who collected something to the effect of $4.2 billion in insurance money, on the destruction of these towers. And you'll have people look at all the political corruption and point to the Bush administration and point to all of the obvious things 
that are central to the narrative here, to the material realm. These things that are intrinsic to the physical side of things that went on. But there's a spiritual angle here, too. And that's something most people don't want to look at. The spiritual connotation or the occult side of it. And if you've listened to this program for any length of time, you know I'm not afraid to delve into that. And once again tonight, we're going to do that. And I've done some breakdowns in the past, several episodes now, about 9-11 because it is a hugely important marking point in our world. It's a crossover. It's a gateway event. It's important in the occult. And most people can't get past just the physical notion here of what's gone on. The mainstream narrative. And although people reject the mainstream narrative in a lot of ways, they still don't want to accept that perhaps there's something deeper going on here than political machinations or money interests or things of this nature or just straight-out corruption in government and politics and military, all of these things. So even though a lot of people don't accept the narrative, what's been done about it? That's the biggest problem. What has been done to get to the bottom of the events that happened that day? It's been a whole lot of nothing, and there's very few people still waving the flag about trying to find truth about 9-11. It seems to have faded into the background as other things have happened in the world since then. And it should still be something that is being discussed and investigated. I had the sincere pleasure of being at a convention this past weekend, speaking at a convention at the Free World FM convention that we had called Free World NYC, with one Mr. Richard Gage. And Mr. Richard Gage has incriminating evidence that this was most definitely an inside job. No doubt about it. Ironclad evidence that these were controlled demolitions of these towers. And he's actually taking this to court. So pray for Richard Gage. Himself and several lawyers that he got involved are actually trying to take this to court to get an official investigation into the events of 9-11. And I'll tell you what, he's got the goods. So pray for that gentleman and hope he can actually make some headway. Because the things he has for evidence, it's enough to convict people on crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, mass murder, these kind of things. Because it's evidence that it was controlled demolitions. But that's just an aside here, because I want to look at the occult side of this. But just understanding what we've been told as the mainstream narrative of this, it does not stand up to muster. And I think just about everybody realizes it at this point. Unless, of course, they're totally brainwashed by their television sets and they're sitting, driving alone in their cars with a mask on their face. If those are the ones, I don't think we can help them anymore. I'll be honest. I try. I try to get through to people with this stuff. But... So much of the indoctrination just has a grip on some of them to the point where you just can't get through anymore. And that's a shame. We should still try, though. We should still try. But at any rate here, the whole notion behind this is I think there's something hugely compelling and important about looking at the occult side of this and the occult details. And breaking it down, this was a massive ritual. Let's be honest about it. From the spiritual stance, this was a massive ritual. Like I said, I have covered some of this before in the past. And we're going to dig a little deeper here tonight. Just focusing on the devil in the details. The occult side. 
thinking about those photographs and the things that actually happened that day and how the news coverage presented it. It was all textbook indoctrination of fear into the masses. Fear of the unknown. They were mastering this practice at that time. They've done very well in the past with it, but this was pretty much 24-7 in your face where they kept reinforcing this fear narrative, making you believe certain things that were not true, that there were certain terrorist organizations involved in this, terrorist organizations that do not actually exist. There's no such thing as Al-Qaeda, folks. There is no organization out there, no Muslim organization or terrorist organization of any sort named Al-Qaeda that operates out there. That was strictly something made up by the intelligence community. Al-Qaeda means the database. That's what it means. The database. And this is a, a name that they gave this operation. It was very much a psychological operation. They named, they gave a name to an invisible enemy they wanted the people to fear. And they used... Muslim extremism as their angle of setting this up because they did actually have some out there in the Middle Eastern communities that were very angry at America's foreign policy practices and military operations that had taken place in portions of the Middle East. And there were some extremists that had acted in the past. And they very much utilized this. They never let a good crisis go to waste. So they leveraged off of this, the existence of these small groups of these disenfranchised extremists that were not happy with America's role in things. So they leveraged off of that, and they created this invisible boogeyman that they called Al-Qaeda. And they gave it to us lock, stock, and barrel, that day, in 2001. Now, they had been looking for Osama bin Laden for some time, ostensibly. Didn't know where he was, if you believe the official narrative. And I don't. It's an out-and-out -out lie. You see, Osama bin Laden, for those of you who don't know, actually was CIA trained and funded. His name was Tim Osman. He'd been to the White House. He's been to military bases around the United States. I have a photo of him with Zbigniew Brzezinski, one of the key strategists in the Carter administration and later the Obama administration. One of the key foreign policy guys. That's right, Osama bin Laden and Zbigniew Brzezinski in a photo op together. So much of this being able to look back now with hindsight was a contrived narrative. But like I said, those were the relatively early days of the internet. So most people didn't have access to that type of information and didn't know diddly squat about it. So you wouldn't know that this Osama bin Laden was actually a CIA asset named Tim Osman and that he likely died sometime in 2001. because he had some serious kidney problems, needed to receive dialysis. And there's many that theorized that he didn't live through the year 2001. I can't say for sure if that's true or not. But there's been a lot of speculation as to such. So they came up with this invisible enemy, and they love invisible enemies, don't they, folks? They sure love to give you an invisible enemy that you can't see coming, that might be just around the corner, that might might do you some harm. So they have a lot of these different types of narratives. And at that time, it was this Islamic extremism they were using as their invisible boogeyman, terrorism. 
They used that as the invisible enemy, and they stoked the fires of fear within the people by performing this mass ritual. And having done so, they immediately instituted their pre-made, ready to go, just ready to be signed into law ahead of time, their Patriot Act and their National Defense Authorization Act that limited the rights of the citizens. Nothing patriotic about the Patriot Act, folks. Nothing at all. Where they hindered people's travel, they restricted people, it was an excuse for them to begin putting in place this total surveillance grid. And they're really ramping things up the past couple of years, aren't they? We could see this. If we're honest about it, we could see how the same things have been done since then now. With different invisible enemies, different aspects of the total surveillance systems, they want to know everything about you. They want a digital dossier on every single human being alive on Earth. And they're almost there. They have the infrastructure in place for all of it. And they have so many different data points on each person that it's outrageous. And they do this in the name of your safety, public health, the well-being of the greater good. They love to wave around the notion of the greater good. So there's all of these plans and all of these events that have led towards this total panopticon control grid that they're setting up, which I refer to as the Antichrist system, because certainly that's what it is. We were warned about this in the Bible. Won't be able to buy or sell without the mark or the number of the name. Interesting ideas, for sure. But all of this, all of this began to be implemented in earnest here, in an active way, with the events of September 11, 2001. And since then, they've only doubled down. And we're beginning to see many of these plans snapping into place. But I've got good news, folks. The future is not written in stone, and we can indeed change this. And I think the tide is shifting in the overall zeitgeist or spirit of the time. People are beginning to wake up in droves to not only the government corruption, but the lies and manipulations about every aspect of everything. And they're beginning to realize that, whoa, time out, hold the phone. None of this was ever about my well-being. They're beginning to realize that the ones who are implementing all of these changes in the world do not have their well-being in mind. And that's good news that people are finally beginning to see, hey, you know what, they lied to us and this caused more harm than good. So first of all, either A, they're incompetent, or B, they're malicious... So having those two options, either one of those options would tend to lean towards, I don't trust them. Rightfully so. So you could give them the benefit of the doubt and just say that they're totally incompetent, don't know what they're doing, and that's the source of our woes. But there's evidence to suggest that that's not the case, that they are indeed malicious and that's where we get to the occult connotations attached here. The spiritual side of it that steps outside of the bounds of our, the normal box of our thinking. And we can begin to make some synchro mystic connections. We'll connect some dots and be able to infer some things based upon these little bits of synchromystic metadata out there 
So tonight, once again, we're going to be reading from The Most Dangerous Book in the World, 9-11 as Mass Ritual by S.K. Bain, and I can't recommend this book enough. This guy did his homework. He knew what he was talking about, about the occult side of this stuff. And I don't think he's wrong about anything he's presented in this book. And I've read the thing just about cover to cover. And I don't think he's been too far off the mark on much of anything. And certainly, if you've done any study or research into the occult or the mystical fraternities, the secret brotherhoods, the secret society groups, any of these things, you would know that this guy's on point with what he's telling you. Especially if you look at the modern advent of what we would call occultism. These things, these organizations, these groups that have largely adopted many of the ideologies that were founded with Aleister Crowley and Madame Blavatsky. They're the two big ones in Western esotericism that are always used and quoted and leveraged on. And these two in particular were two of the biggest offenders when it comes to the inversion process, the inversion principle. Now, they're not the only ones. They're not even largely some of the most prominent ones. Well, Crowley maybe is one of the most prominent ones. But many of these ideas come directly from these types of individuals. And it's all based upon inversion of old natural order principles that were known in the ancient mystery schools and were brought forward through the secret society groups and were perverted, distorted, and inverted in the modern era. So these things that arrive in our day as what we would call modern Western esotericism or modern Western occultism these things are all based upon the inversion principle. And if I could define the inversion principle, the best way to think about the inversion principle is Satanism. Pure Satanism is the inversion principle. So that's what we're dealing with here, folks. Because largely these people in positions of power today at the topmost levels of our power structure in this world are dark occultists who practice this secret doctrine, this secret religion. You could refer to most of the principles that they follow as the ones presented by Crowley or Thalema. The will, that's what Thalema means, the will. And its biggest precept is do as thou will is the whole of the law. You see, these people in control... They have different foundational morals and ethics than we do. They have different foundational belief systems. They practice a secret, ancient, mystery religion that has been so distorted and contorted from the original that it is inverse to the natural order. It is inverse to all that is right and good and godly. And they use different figures like Crowley as their poster children. Nothing is sacred to these people. And they think they are better than you. They think they are smarter than you. They think you don't deserve to know any of their esoteric secrets. They think you don't deserve to know any of that. In fact, many of them don't even believe that you even have a soul. Unless you belong to one of their secret society groups and have been initiated through their systems. And then, only then, do you have the inkling or awakening of a soul. And thus they view you as little more than animals. Livestock, herd animals... Ever wonder where the term herd immunity came from? Why would they refer to us as a herd? Well, they think of you as little more than animals. Commodities to be bought, sold, and traded. Destroyed when the need be. To feed the system. 
So that being the case, let's get into the reading here. And we'll begin to connect some dots. After all we've learned, after reconstructing the occult script and contemplating the incredible time, energy, and effort that the orchestrators of 9-11 put into creating their occult masterpiece, there's yet another potentially devastating blow. The possibility that they do not actually believe what they've invested so much treasure in convincing us they do believe. Again, it's Michael Hoffman guiding us through the maze, and he says, quote, Alistair Crowley, in a statement to the OTO initiates concerning one of his books, describes the underlying epistemology behind the glamour and enchantment which causes the occult con game to become the weird reality we inhabit in America today. And this is what Crowley said, quote, In this book it is spoken of the Sephiroth and the paths of spirits and conjurations, of gods, spheres, planes, and many other things which may or may not exist. It is immaterial whether they exist or not. By doing certain things, certain results follow. Students are mo most earnestly warned against attributing objective reality or philosophic validity to any of them." End quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So it doesn't matter if it's true or not, according to Crowley. What matters is that it gets results, these things that they do. They cause results. These rituals that they perform, they have a most definitive effect. They get the results. So let's continue on. So Hoffman concludes, and he says... Here Crowley admits that the OTO is a vehicle for imposing an artificial reality based on nothing but lies and promoted by liars initiated into the art and science of illusion. End quote. Going to pause for a moment there, folks. So this truly is the inversion principle. And what have I always been saying? For as long as I've been on the air broadcasting these types of shows... It's all about the complete inversion of the natural order, creating a wholly artificial system based upon deception and lies and the inversion principle, opposite of natural law, natural order. And that's what's being reaffirmed here. The OTO and Crowley and many of these occultists, these high ranking in their secret orders, occultists, these dark occultists who run things in this world. They're imposing an artificial reality on the rest of the world based on lies by these folks who've been initiated into the arts of science, of the illusion process, creating this grand illusion that we're in reality crafting of sorts, an artificial reality. And you see, this all lends itself further into the ideas associated with the transhumanist philosophy, because what better way to create a completely artificial new world is the digital realm. The digitization of everything the digitization of the human mind, and that's what they're working on. You see, what they've done is they've taken these old alchemical principles and they've inverted them and twisted them and perverted them into something grotesque. And now they've accompanied that with technology as a force multiplier. And the technology is the conduit through which they can get this stuff done. So just as an aside here, let's keep that in mind as we go forward. And we could see, if we look back at September 11th, 2001, we've been ingratiated into this period where things are beginning to cascade into this culmination of this grand plan that they have. And we would not have thought back then, 22 years ago, about anything like this being within the very near future for us. 
the transhumanist movement, singularity, these types of notions. It's all the fulfillment of the old occult sciences, folks, but in the inverse version of it, the detrimental version to humanity, not in a way in which humanity goes up a level, elevates, but it's for the declination of humanity. It's not about enlightenment for humanity or stepping up, awakening that grand spiritual idea of ascension. This is the opposite of ascension. It's the inversion principle. That's what they're looking for. They want to lock down man, keep him trapped in this material paradigm. That's the ultimate fulfillment of their great work in their twisted inversion principle-based view. These dark occultists at the top of the power structure, they want nothing more than that, and they can be the controllers of that. At least they think so. But I don't think that's the case. I think they're in for a rude awakening. But let's continue on here. So it says here, so in the end, is Aleister Crowley himself delivering the most devastating blow of all? Is this the final insult added to massive injury? Despite all the symbols and astrology and hocus pocus, it's all just a game. Hoffman once more confirms our fears. And he says, quote, according to Fordian philosopher William Grimstad, it is the implementation, sorry, not the implementation, it is the implantation of this illusory picture of the world into our minds, a process of widespread, indeed virtually universal, hallucination emerging from extremely circumscribed and elusive sources that forms the major activity of the hidden powers, end quote. So I'm going to pause for a second here, folks. So it's this crafting of the world around you by these few select social engineers. They affect your mind in certain ways. They could alter your viewpoints. And the thing is, with our technologies the way they are, if you have no other access or conduit to the outside world other than your television screen, what would you think the world is like? If you watch the news programs every night, you would think it's an absolutely horrible, terrifying place. Violent. Violent, terrifying world of immeasurable horrors out there. And it, now, if that was your only access to the world around you, you wouldn't know any different. This is how they craft our belief systems. And it's a little more subtle for most people. They don't necessarily pick up on the cues. This has been done for a long time. It's been a slow roll, a slow indoctrination process. Started with newspaper publications and books, controlled books. What do you think book burnings were all about? Got to have some type of a system to control information. Then from there, when we got the advent of radio, boy, that was a huge thing for certain in the social engineering of the masses. They've done an awful lot of experimentation on that, and we have documented studies, and we've gone through some of those here. As to the power of radio broadcasting for the implementation of information, and for the steering of public opinion. And then, with the advent of television, the greatest mind control tool ever created, then, if they could add images to the words being conveyed, visual representations, visual images, they really had a mind hook for the people. They really had grand access to shaping public opinion. There's been a lot of research and study on this as well. I'm talking scientific academic studies have been done in the best ways for implanting ideas 
opinions into people's minds. The studies have been done. The research has been done. It's a known commodity. Now add to that the spiritual side of these things, the spiritual component, and you have a recipe for total human behavior modification, and it's been done on a grand scale and continues to be done. And as we get more attached, literally and figuratively, to our technologies, the greater the implementation of these methods can be applied. Because it is your primary gateway to the world around you, to what's happening in the world around you. Now, as of right now, you can still go out in your local community and see what's going on, and usually that's far different than anything that's presented in news media from what's going on. And those things don't necessarily affect you on your local level, but they do affect your unconscious and subconscious mind, what's presented to you on the television. If you have some type of an inclination that perhaps some of what they're telling you, even if it's just a small portion of it, has a ring of truth to it, has a little bit of truth applied to it, then you have something to ponder and wonder about and be concerned with, potentially. Because, see, that's the thing. Even though most people at this point are will readily accept that they are lied to on a grand scale by the news media, they still will go out in their local community and they'll see things that have been talked about on their local newscasts actually out there in the community. And they think, oh, well, you know, this is, they're telling the truth. This is a trustworthy source. So then they have that connection, that emotional attachment to their local community news organization, their preferred news organization. So with this emotional attachment invested in that now, it gives more credence to the information being presented to the viewer, even if they can recognize as such, okay, that's a national news story that's probably nonsense or bogus. Even though they recognize that on a conscious level, still, they have the nagging doubt in their subconscious about it. Well, maybe, maybe it is true. Maybe I'm mistaken about all of this. You ever get there? You ever have that happen to you where you're, you're thinking, you're double-guessing yourself? When you see something, a news story or something that seems to be really popular and everybody's all upset about, and you look at it, and immediately your nonsense meter goes off and you say, it's nonsense. And you recognize it's nonsense. But don't you once in a while still get that nagging doubt? in your mind about that event or that story what if it is true do you ever get that nagging doubt in your mind you see the influence that this has even if you recognize it as nonsense it still has an invariable effect on your mind and you always always wind up second guessing things because none of us are absolutely 100% certain of the nature of all of this stuff. And that's a fact. None of us has all the answers. I don't know what I don't know. So with that being the case, sometimes you see something and you think, well, maybe it's a completely fabricated story. And then later you find out maybe there's details about it that hold up to be true. So then you have to wonder, was it really all fabricated? Was a portion of it fabricated? Was it all true? And you have these nagging doubts, and 9-11 is very much one of these types of events. Because there's just so much intricate detail in all of it. So that being the case, although we don't have all the answers, what we can do is use our skills of discernment and pattern recognition to be able to call a spade a spade. And I absolutely 100% see all of these occult attachments to this event and know that on some level it is a massive ritual. It was a massive ritual, and we're seeing the fruits of that ritual coming to fruition today 
here we are 22, 22 years later and we've seen things come about since then that kick the football further down the road for the planning of these dark occultists who run things at the top of it all. This was a very intricately planned operation. Let's be clear about that. Now, who or what did the planning? That's the big question we all have. Now, we do think there's some key players on the physical, material world side of it, and that's what most people focus on. But that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Because underneath the surface, there are occult influences, there are occult powers, spiritual powers, behind the scenes, behind the veil, that have orchestrated a lot of this. I think that a beyond human intelligence has at least guided some of this, especially on the occult side of things, when we look at all these connections. So with that being said, let's go ahead, because right here, Crowley was talking about the major activity of the hidden powers. You see, it doesn't matter, in the views of the occultist, if what they're presenting is true or not. It's the fact that it gets results, and it activates these hidden powers. Now, what are these hidden powers? Well... They do have some knowledge in the occult about the certain aspects of some of these hidden powers. These would be spiritual type energetic principles, entities, beings, intelligences. I don't know what word you want to use to describe them. It's something that kind of defies our limited language for describing it. I think the Bible describes it best. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers of darkness, wickedness in high places. That most certainly does have an influence here. And that influence seems to be one of the orchestrating factors on the occult side of this. Now, these things do, at points, begin to be become manifest through human beings and certain actions of human beings. So there are certainly human beings involved in this and people involved in a lot of planning aspects of things like this, for sure. But I don't think it stops with that, because this is probably the number one thing that the magicians recognize. We do certain things and we get results. We don't necessarily understand the mechanics behind it. But we know if we do action A, we get result B. This is a known commodity to those people that practice these dark, occult, magical rituals, ceremonies, cast these types of spells. They know this. And if this is a bridge too far for some people, just turn, change the word magic into causal engineering. There's a definitive science behind this. That's why they use rituals. They know certain rituals work to bring about certain things, certain results. That's why they do it. They don't necessarily understand the mechanics behind it, how it works, but they understand that it does work, and therefore they do this because it gets results. Can't emphasize that enough. So you could argue the semantics about what these energies or intelligences or spirits are behind the scenes, that bring this into physical manifestation in many ways, or help to orchestrate things, could argue the semantics of that all day long. I don't doubt that there is something like that behind the scenes working in these ways. Don't doubt it at all. But there will be disagreements as to the nature of these energies, intelligences. These intelligent energies, I think that's the best way to describe it, intelligent energies. So that being the case... We see this. They know that certain actions result in certain consequences. Seems logical, doesn't it? We see the same thing just on a very basic day-to-day -day physical level in our normal everyday lives. 
Certain actions result in certain consequences. We know that. Well, the same thing applies to this magical ritual narrative that they have going on. So let's continue on here, because I still have some ground to cover here. So it says here, they may or may not be true believers in their own occult system, and this may be the biggest psyop of all. That we'll never know for sure whether they're satanically empowered practitioners of evil, or just damn smart hucksters using their own ignorance and fears to help them facilitate their goals and consolidate their power. I'm going to pause there, and I'm going to say it's probably a combination of both. That seems more likely to me. Obviously, there's dupes out there. You really think W was smart enough to <laughs> pull all this off on his own? No, nah, man. No way. No how. There were other intelligences at work, and a bunch of useful idiots at work, and that, that goes across the board for just about everything like this that happens, any type of a grand ritual event that occurs like this. You have willing participants, you have orchestrating intelligences, and you have the useful idiots, and all these combinations of things are there, and some people benefit from certain things, and some people may not. And some people are completely oblivious to all of it, but they go along with it anyway because it does benefit them. So you have all of these different combinations of factors here. But to keep in mind now, it's all about this illusion crafting that goes on. This presenting something as a reality that may or may not actually be a reality. And this has been done in so many different ways. You see, it's crafting a fantasy-based reality. That's what we're in. Our view of reality is mostly fantasy-based when it comes down to it. Our views on society and culture. Like, I'll use an example here. What is your impression of your average Hollywood celebrity? What do you think of these people? If I say Hollywood celebrity, let's use one for example, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. If I talk about The Rock, what are your thoughts on him? What do you think he's like as a person? What are your views on him? You see, you don't know him personally, but based upon how you see him act on television... You would think he's probably a macho, dynamic type individual, very well outspoken, and, and probably an overall nice guy, but a nice guy you don't want to mess with. You would think that. And you think he's funny and charming, and those things may or may not be true. You see, it's a facade, folks. He's an actor. An actor could perform anything you want them to perform. They can make you believe anything about them. He might not even be who he claims to be. I don't know. It's, the evidence seems likely that he really is a third-generation wrestler who turned into a movie superstar and has a strange fixation with doing movies in the jungle. I don't know. But <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But I don't know the guy. You don't know the guy. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. I can't speak for you. But I personally don't know the guy. So I don't know what his personality is like. All I know is I see the persona, the image that he projects. And this is it. It's the image. Controlling the image that we get conveyed about these things. That's the important part. The crafting of the image. So just to drive the point home, we're presented with this image of reality. And maybe that's the true nature of things, and maybe it's not. But we don't know unless we go out there and we check. But how much of us go out there and we check? And what do we find when we check? Now, if you use technologies and mass media tools like has been done, and you just keep presenting image after image after image to people all day long, their discernment becomes muddied. They have a harder time discerning what's true and what's false, especially when you buffet them with false images. And I'll use the example of AI-generated pictures and photographs, deep fakes, 
You present people with enough of this. CGI, computer-generated images in films, in entertainment that look very hyper-realistic. It becomes harder and harder to distinguish between what's reality and what's not. And the more of that you're inundated with, the more images you're inundated with like this, the harder it becomes to determine what is a true image and what is a false image. And to the occultist, it doesn't matter whether it's true or false. It's the result that the image gets. And that's what we're pointing to here. I can't emphasize enough. And I don't know if people are, have been picking up on this notion or not. The image is the huge aspect of all of this. Image. The image presented. It's the core unit of symbology or leveraging of the archetype that's being done is through the image presented. And it has an indelible effect on the human psyche. So knowing that, that these people are all about crafting images, mostly false images, to keep our minds from being able to have proper discernment of truth and falsity, we have this fantastical reality being presented to us. And it has certain effects on our mind. And in fact, one of the major things they want to invoke in our mind is fear. And all the negative things that go along with fear. Because the negative emotions allow more control over the people. Fear, folks, is the opposite of love. The absolute inversion principle of love is fear. Hate, as people would think, hate. Not the opposite of love. It's fear. Fear. Now, knowing this and seeing how they craft their illusions to affect our psyches in certain ways, and to steer our opinions and behaviors, we know a little something. So let's continue on, because now we're going to get into this image that was displayed in the smoke on the front page, I think it was of the New York Post. Could be mistaken, actually, I think it was multiple newspapers of the time showed this image of this face of the devil in the smoke on the tower on that day. So let's read here. So now S.K. Bain, the author of this book, identifies this not as the devil, but as the face of Ahriman, and we've talked about the Aramonic principle here before, and this is a term, a name that Rudolf Steiner applied to certain aspects of this Antichrist spirit that has become manifest in this day. So let's keep that in mind as we continue here. So starting out this portion here, there's a quote from David Cronenberg's motion picture, Videodrome. And he says, quote, Your reality is already half hallucination. If you're not careful, it will become total hallucination. End quote. And then we have a little blurb here of one of the newspaper articles. I think it was on... I think this, this photo first started making rounds two days after 9-11. So this, would, I think, would be September 13th of 2001 that this is from and in this newspaper article it shows the big picture of this image of the face of the devil or Araman in the smoke and it says is this the face of evil in the headline and it goes on here I'll read there's two paragraphs or three paragraphs here that we can read so it says, some see not only the hand, but also the face of the devil. In Tuesday's attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, 
No sooner had U.S. papers printed this picture of the atrocity than they received calls, at least 70, from readers saying they could see a face with horns in the smoke. Was the photo manipulated, they wondered. And it goes on here to say no, was the answer, but I can't make out the rest of what it says in this newspaper clipping. So they claimed in the newspaper this actually was a real image, wasn't manipulated. But of course the numbers here are telling. Maybe there is some manipulation going on because it was 70, it says at least 70 people. 70. Could be coincidence. Or maybe there's some occult tie to the number 70 here being made. Hard to tell. But then here, S.K. Bain goes on to ask, A physical manifestation of evil or Photoshop? Did the face of evil appear in the smoke billowing from the Twin Towers on 9-11? Well, it is certainly true that anthropomorphic images can appear in clouds and smoke, given all the other trickery that went into creating the 9-11 mega-spectacle, it is unlikely that the appearance of the image above is mere coincidence. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. doesn't mean that it was legitimately there or that photoshopping went on. Not saying that photoshopping didn't go on. I mean, that's certainly a possibility because we had seen other images that were photoshopped at that time. And like I said, this was in the relatively early days of the Internet and things like Photoshop weren't as sophisticated as they are now, so it was a little bit harder to pull it off, a fake back then. But I digress on that point. That's not the important part here. But what he's saying is it goes beyond being a coincidence, which I agree. So he says, The likelihood of it being coincidence is even smaller when one compares the face in the smoke to a famous carving of Ahriman by Austrian esotericist Rudolf Steiner. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. And certainly you can look up this picture. And if you put these pictures side by side, the face on the tower, and this head of Ahriman carved out of stone, you'll begin to see... They look almost identical. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. So let's go ahead and we'll briefly describe what we're seeing here. So S.K. Bain goes on here and he says, Ahriman was the god of evil and darkness in Persian mythology and in Zoroastrianism, a religion that attracted a large following in Persia around 600 B.C., often called Druj, D-R-U-J, which means, and he has in parentheses here, the lie. Ahriman was the force behind anger, greed, envy, and other negative and harmful emotions. He also brought chaos, death, disease, and other ills into the world. In the Islamic religion, he is identified with Iblis, the devil. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the devil is, in fact, in the details. Ahriman, in the Islamic religion, is con concurrent with Iblis, the devil of the Islamic faith. And this predates our modern religious systems, this notion of Ahriman. And I think that's why the term was adopted by Steiner. Why the application was put into place by Steiner, he recognized that some of these ancient spiritual forces, these intelligent energies, if you will, they've transcended time and culture, manifest in different ways, had different names associated with them. And this is what he attached it to. He went back to the Zoroastrian myth, the archetype associated with the Zoroastrian religion and the Persians in their mythology and he took the name Ahriman and applied it here and it could be concurrent with our modern notion of the devil in Christian theology. Ahriman is the all-destroying Satan, the source of all evil in the world. Rudolf Steiner, the initiator of the Anthroposophy movement, 
had published detailed and elaborate studies on the Zoroastrian Ahriman. He claims that Ahriman and the Hebrew demon Mephistopheles can be considered as the same spiritual energies with the biblical demons Mammon and Beelzebub as his associates. Ahriman's assignment is to alienate humanity from its spiritual roots and to inspire materialism and heartless technical control. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. You see, this Aramonic influence is at the heart of the spirit of Antichrist. It's all about focusing man into the hyper-materialist viewpoint. Consumerism, technical control, technology, science... The deification of science, Araman is the spirit behind our modern science, or if you'd prefer, call it scientism, because that's what it's become. They've taken this thing, this methodology of observation and study and experiment, and they've turned it into a religion. Science is the religion of the New Age, folks. It is the god of the New Age. It is the, at the heart of the Aramonic influence. They call it science. So let's keep that in mind. As such, his influence is highly relevant to present-day Western culture. Araman's acolytes seek a kind of immortality in the slag earth surrounded with old moon forces, but an immortality with egotistic earthly consciousness instead of the cosmic consciousness of the individualized spirit ego. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So some of this might sound a little out of bounds to you or a bridge too far, but this is at the core of some of the teachings of esotericism. And especially if you go back and you look at the Rosicrucian Cosmo conception of things. A lot of it's derived from Rosicrucian thoughts. You see, they think what's going on right now, and this has been verified by some people, some people who claim to know about these things, the spiritual side of them, that beginning back in 2012, around Christmas time of 2012, that a new energetic influence manifest here and split the world in certain ways, wherein now we have a remnant that is turning towards the spiritual side of things, a remnant that will turn towards the ascension principle of the new age, the promised ascension principle of the Aquarian age, and we have those that are going to be left behind here in the material realm of Earth as we know it here. And this absolutely aligns one-to-one -one with this notion of Araman or Antichrist. This is the spiritual intelligence, the influence, the intelligent energetic principle that seeks to trap the human mind and human consciousness here in the strictly physical material world paradigm bind us with this new principle of science blinding me with science. Have you heard that? Blinding us with science. Blinded by the light. And there's a Luciferic connotation associated there too. You see, Steiner had very different thoughts on the differences between Araman and Lucifer. But in my viewpoint, in my studies, this is where I disagree with Steiner. I think they're two sides of the same coin. I think the Luciferic principle goes hand in hand with the Aramonic principle. And the combination of the two, one is the physical side, one is the metaphysical side of the Antichrist spirit. I see them both as one and the same, whereas Steiner saw them as two separate entities or intelligences. I see them as one and the same. One more concerned with spiritual things, the other focused on materiality. Two aspects of this intelligence 
That's my view, and I reserve the right to be totally wrong on that. I'm no Rudolf Steiner, but Steiner was also complacent or complicit with the state of the world being how it is, although I think towards the end of his life he tried to make some remediations of that. But just being part of these secret society groups, that's problematic in and of itself. Because if these things are so important to the future of humanity, why do you keep them hidden and secret from the masses? If it's really for the benefit of everyone, if it's really about spiritual ascension, this kind of thing, why do they keep these notions hidden? And I'm sorry, that whole notion of don't cast your pearls before swine only goes so far in my view. The information should be available for everyone. There should be no secret information, no secrets of the ages hidden from mankind as a whole by a select few who think themselves or deem themselves worthy of being the arbiters of the secrets. That's not right. No good could come from secrecy, in my view. It's that same notion that people will answer with about this whole surveillance system that's been set up. Well, I've got nothing to hide, so I've got nothing to worry about. Really? Well, why do these people hide the things they hide if they must have something to worry about? Right? And what is it? Well, it's about losing control and power. Selfish reasons for this. It's not for the advancement of the race, the evolution of the race, as they claim in their esoteric doctrines. But at any rate, that was enough of a side tangent. Let's get back to this, because there's still some ground to cover before we sign off. So we have this notion here that Araman, this influence here, well, I'll begin reading that again. Araman's acolytes seek a kind of immortality in the slag earth surrounded with old moon forces, but an immortality with egotistic earthly consciousness instead of the cosmic consciousness of the individualized spirit ego. The deeper Aramonic aim of the Anglo-Americans is to defeat the God's plan for Earth evolution by turning the Earth into a heap of dark, frozen cosmic slag haunted by an Earth-bound mankind of ghostly homunculi and to secure for themselves a privileged place in this Aramonic world order, an Aramonic immortality with earthly consciousness and with power over the uninitiated. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. I don't think I could describe it any better than that. That is certainly what their plan is. But see, they also have other notions of things. And this is from the views of groups like the Rosicrucians of groups like the Theosophists, the Anthropothophists. These types. This Aramonic aim is to defeat the natural order plan for evolution. This is their claim. By turning Earth into an unliving thing, pretty much, an artificial thing. Not a natural order. An artificial one. Haunted by an earthbound mankind of ghostly homunculi, the homunculus. That's a concept I might have to explore a little bit deeper on some future shows here. To get into, I've talked about the gullum and the homunculus before. In a limited capacity. But this is certainly what the end result of transhumanism is, what post-humanism is. You see, it would be this homunculus of sorts. In earthbound mankind that has a very base consciousness here. An earthbound consciousness, one that cannot ascend spiritually anymore. Bound in materiality. That's where they want us. That's why they try to describe everything 
as a material paradigm construct. They'll even try to explain away consciousness in a material world type of a, an outline. And they've come up with all kinds of researches to lead the way for this so that they can quantify human consciousness. Because if you could quantify a thing or count it, measure it, then that gives you some modicum of control over it. So they've sought to do this with the human mind, and they do this through brain modeling. And one particular model is called a Bayesian brain model that they've used, and this gives them their closest thing to an actual physical mechanism of action for describing and potentially controlling human consciousness, the Bayesian brain modeling. This has everything to do with transhumanism, has everything to do with this occult connotation here of the advent of Araman or Antichrist. This is the Antichrist spirit, folks. No doubt in my mind. This Aramonic influence. Like I said, it does have a Luciferic principle attached to it as well. A false paradigm of spirituality. You see, that's the hook. That's to get the people on the hook. Because human beings have this innate quality. We yearn for the spiritual. We yearn for God. And we seek to fill that void in our life with some spiritual thing. So the Luciferic principle is the spiritual side of this Aramonic influence. And when people seek after that spiritual side... They find themselves, when they go down these occult roads, steered more into the material paradigm. Always happens. Always. Look at the things that all of these occultists of the past have gotten caught up in. They really firmly believed... that they were advancing themselves spiritually and that they would become gods in and of themselves, seeking after this light, this false light, that led them further into the materialist paradigm, where they got themselves hooked on drugs, involved in debaucherous sexual acts, steeped in the mystic, surrounded by debased things. I'll use Aleister Crowley as the prime example. You could go and look at that guy's life and see how it all ended for him. He's not a god. He didn't ascend anywhere, did he? He didn't live forever, become immortal. It's all a false promise, folks. It's the great lie from the Garden of Eden. You can be as gods. And people don't recognize the truth of the Bible. The most important book you'll ever read. Pick it up. Read the Bible. Get into right relation with your creator, folks. We're living in unprecedented times. And that's the only thing that's going to see us through is a right relationship with God. Understand that now more than ever. Let's go ahead and read on here, though. So we have here, it says, a digitally created tribute. It is most certainly possible that the face in the smoke was created using digital image editing software, such as Adobe Photoshop, and intended to be not simply the face of evil, providing yet further evidence of occult psychological warfare tactics, but also a tribute to Araman and Steiner, for those in the know. So it says here, Aramonic Purpose. And here we have the Aramonic Purpose. The central rite of Satanism, or black magic, sometimes crude, sometimes sophisticated, is the deliberate ritual torture and killing of animals and at a more advanced level of humans. When done in a precise way, this practice confers knowledge and power upon the practitioner. Also, it affects the whole earth, hardening and rigidifying it to the characteristic aramonic purpose. So I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. So, we see the end results of following 
these occult paths. Like I said, the more they seek after that light, that false light, that Luciferic side of spirituality, to fill that yearning in their heart, to fill that void for their seeking of God, they seek after this, and it leads them down this path, the central right of which it says here, is the ritual torture and killing of animals and human beings when you get to the higher levels. And this allegedly confers knowledge to them. Gnosis. Gnosis can't save you folks. You see, at the end of the day, you can't save yourself, and knowledge can't save you. Gnosis will not save you. Initiation will not save you. These are all lies born in the pit of hell, and they're all taught and established through these secret society groups and the teachings that they give you. There's one way of salvation. Like I said, it's has to do with getting in right relationship with God. It's not about religion. And modern man has made it all about religion. They try to sum everything up as black and white. Religion. It's not about that. It's about relationship with God. And there was a way made in which you can have this right relationship with God, and it's a free gift given to all mankind. A free gift given out of love and mercy by God himself. He made a way for us. And the occultists don't like this because it presents a stumbling block for their ideologies. He made the way. It's a free gift. A gift given by the grace of God. Not by the works of man, lest any man should boast. Free gift. All you have to do is accept it. It's as easy as that. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior accepting that free gift, thanking him for it, having a thankful spirit towards him. That's where it starts. And then he'll guide and direct your paths. All it takes is to acknowledge, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all done wrong, wrong things. We're incapable of saving ourselves from this spiritual onslaught that's coming. It's all about getting in that right relationship with God, folks. If you get there, you're good. He'll direct your paths from there. All it takes is faith, and faith and belief are two different things. A lot of people believe a lot of things that aren't true. But having faith that your God, your Creator, the Creator of everything, has made a way for you, and will direct your steps and your path and hold you up and guide you through. Just having that simple faith alone will actually get you there, will get you through to the other side. But see, these dark powers at play here in the world, they don't want that. They want as many people trapped in this physical materialist paradigm as possible. That they can have some power or influence over. These ones who think they're the oh-so-powerful occultists, they've got another thing coming. They're going to be just as enslaved as the rest in this system. They somehow think they're going to circumvent that in themselves. They'll be the controlling factor that runs it all. And that notion in and of itself, folks, is a lie. They've bought wholesale into this fantasy. The ones that are pushing this notion, pushing this transhumanist advent. And what are we talking about here? Let's let's break it down to brass tacks for you. Okay? We're going to we're going to do this. We're going to go there. Essentially what the plan is is they want everyone's brain wired into the internet of things so that they can monitor your thoughts. Your thoughts will be known by every other person within the cloud, within the system. You'll be able to interact with people, experience their same experiences, exchange knowledge. It'll be a hive mind, folks. 
So all of the combined experience and knowledge of all the beings that are living when this whole singularity notion goes online, when all of this becomes attached to this Internet of Things, this subsystem of the Internet of Things known as the Internet of Thoughts, and that is not conspiracy theory or speculation. There are white papers talking about the Internet of Thoughts. It's a real thing being designed as we speak. The Internet of Thoughts. So once this goes online, there will be one giant hive mind that inhabits and manifests through all of these interconnected brains in the web. And of course, they'll tell you, well, you can have multi-bodied existence, or you could exist in a digital avatar, or you could exist in some other physical container. You could transfer your consciousness through the machine in this way, and there'll be this giant hive mind. But here's what's problematic about that. There's no individuation, no individual self. In that anymore. You've given up this notion of what he describes here as K. Bain in this and how Steiner describes it as the ego, the individualized ego. This will be gone. It's going to be one giant hive mind. So what does that mean? Who's going to control the giant hive mind? Who's in control? Who will control your thoughts and actions and the things you do? If your mind is in this, is a, an amalgamation in, in a part, a fractal part of this giant hive mind, how much influence or control will you have? Well, the answer is none. And you see what all of these dark occultists who are trying to get involved with all of this are trying to bring into manifestation this harmonic influence in a way. They ultimately want to be the one that is the god of this new hive mind, the controlling factor. So at the end of the day, when all this happens and all of this goes online, and there's just this one collective hive mind, this one thing left, that's an amalgamation of all your thoughts, experiences, feelings in this physical realm, It'll be one being that's left at the end of it all. And his name will be Lucifer, I assure you. That's all that will remain. That will be the post-human population, populated by one hive mind named Lucifer, seeking to be godlike, seeking to be God, wanting to be God in this place, thinking he can emulate that, through the use of technology. That will be the controlling factor. That will be the spirit in charge. You see, your spirit will be gone if you're part of that system. Eternally trapped in a hell of your own design. A digital prison. Does that sound like a future you want, folks? Now, this may sound like a bridge too far for most, and I totally understand. If you want to tune out after hearing that, because that's a hard pill to swallow. But I assure you, that's the end game. This whole transhumanist notion is just a giant eugenics program. They describe themselves, transhumanism is described by pro-transhumanists as quote-unquote eugenics without coercion. I'm not making this up. It's all about this great culling of people. They'll have them lining up to get the implants, the brain implants. Make them able to perform beyond human abilities have beyond human intelligence, tied into the artificial control grid, to the artificial intelligence network. And many of these people, when they first go online with this, it will appear as if this person is still functioning and operating as themselves in certain ways. 
but their spirit, their animus, will be gone. Won't be there anymore. It'll be a husk of its former self, a homunculus. A being without an indwelt spirit, not a human spirit anyway. There will be an indwelt spirit. But it's not going to be a human spirit behind it. That's the core truth to this. This is what the dark occultists at the top of the power structure seem to know. But see, they want to be, they're fighting to be the controlling influence of this whole thing. They think they can do that. They think that through the power of their will, they can become the god of the new system. And that they will be the one that controls it all. And it's a lie. You see, they'll be just as much a slave to it as the rest that got caught up in it. And it's a hell of their own building. Kind of deep tonight, I know. Going deep on this stuff. But I want to finish out this book, paying tribute here to the things that happened on 9-11 that changed our world and just trying to make people aware of what the ultimate end game is here. So he says here, yet more 9-11 Crowley references. So it says, given the level of planning that went into the other elements of the mega ritual, the following is worthy of consideration. Sigils. A sigil is a symbol designed for a specific magical purpose. They are designed to represent a glyph composed of a variety of symbols or concepts with the intent and inherent iconic meaning. Essentially, sigils are symbolic icons that are condensed representations of more complex ideas or information. A sigil may have an abstract, pictorial, or semi-abstract form. It may appear in any medium, physical or virtual, or only in the mind. Visual symbols are the most popular form, but the use of audio and tactile symbols in magic is not unknown. 9-11 is not technically a sigil in that it, it is not purely a symbolic icon. It can be read at face value. Unless you consider numbers themselves as symbols and assign ultimate importance to the character of these symbols, 9 is evil and 11 is magic. Further, the 11 simultaneously represents the pillars of Hermes and the Twin Towers, Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. That's an assertion I've made long ago, too. Independent of this gentleman, S.K. Bain, who wrote this. So, gives me validation for my understanding of that here. He got it. He understood it. In light of the above, consider the following. The AA, the Argentium Astrum, was the magical order created in 1907 by Aleister Crowley and George Cecil Jones after they left the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The acronym AA has been assigned many meanings, and it says, see the table below. There's a lot of meanings attached to it. In the name of the organization, Argentium Astrum means the Silver Star. It's also called Arcanum Arcanorum, Secret of Secrets. AA is a symbol for Arik Anpin in the Aramaic. And it means vast countenance. And in English, angel and abyss is what AA stands for. So there's a lot of levels of meaning used in this abbreviation. The planners of 9-11 were highly intentional and very sophisticated in developing their occult script for the events of that day. They chose specific things for very specific reasons, as had been well documented. It is indeed possible that they chose American Airlines, AA, for a specific reason, i.e. knowing the name of the airline would in many instances be shortened to AA and linked with the flight numbers AA-11 and AA-77. These alphanumeric combinations have appeared over and over in print and on the web in relation to 9-11. Those knowledgeable about Aleister Crowley and his legacy are fully familiar with AA as an acronym for his order, and AA-11 and AA-77, especially considering the well-established significance of the 11 and 77. 
appear to constitute yet two additional hidden symbolic references to Crowley. In light of all the other Crowley elements in the 9-11 mega ritual, it seems unlikely that this one would be unintentional or purely coincidental. What about United Airlines flights 175 and 93? UA-175 and UA-93? The significance of the 175 and 93 have been thoroughly elucidated. Consider this. The name Crowley may derive from the Irish or the English. The Irish Crowleys are more numerous and are known in Irish as Okruadahalak, a Gaelic name meaning descendant of the hard hero or descendant of the hardy warrior, and which was anglicized to Crowley or O Crowley. The English Crowley means wood of crows. Although Crowley was English, his distant ancestors may have been Irish, but it really doesn't matter. It's the association that's important. Remember that. It's always the association that's important. UA is connected with the surname Crowley and UA-175 and UA-93. The latter, in particular, would carry deep significance for Crowleyites and Thelemites the world over. If real, these sigils would constitute one of the more sophisticated, subtle, and obscure tributes to Crowley. But in the realm of the occult, major points are awarded for exactly this type of thing. Gonna pause for a moment. Absolutely. They love that kind of thing because it puts their fingerprint all over this. And the best thing about it for them is it's plausibly deniable. They love the plausibly deniable factor of all of this stuff. Because they could say, that's ridiculous. And most people would shrug it off and say, yeah, that is ridiculous. <laughs> and they love it. That's how the occultists operate. And then they laugh at you about that. So that being the case, I think we're going to drop it right there. There is a couple more sections to this book, but I wanted to close it up right there. The devil in the details. So now you know a little something about what we were shown on that day, in the smoke, the spirit becoming manifest in this place. That spiritual influence known as Araman. Satan, the devil, Antichrist, Lucifer, whatever whatever kind of name you want to give it. It is the Antichrist principle brought into full view in manifestation on that day, September 11th, 2001. Ostensibly, the beginning of the new age then 11 years later not coincidentally it is said that we have this splitting in society that's been pre-echoed in so many different things we have those who are destined to ascend spiritually and those who will be left behind the symbolism's all over religion too folks Religion, philosophy, entertainment, culture, mythology, all tied together in this intricate pattern where we see this notion that there will be a portion, a remnant that ascends to the next spiritual level here, moves on to greater things, and then there's going to be a, another portion that's left behind to suffer the consequences of being locked into the material paradigm. And of course, Go back about 30 years when transhumanism was only a very teeny little blip on the radar. It was hardly known by anybody. And all of this stuff would have been just fanciful fiction and nonsense. But today, today, we have the technologies, we have the methodologies. It's all out there. It's all about the implementation of it all at this point. That's the whole notion here we need to understand. It's not something that is just a conspiracy theory. There's planning going on. This transhumanist notion of things is most assuredly a planned thing, and it's a portion of this occult practice that's put into play here. So we need to recognize that for what it is. Anyway, folks, that's all I have for tonight. I hope this was informative for you, and I want to Remind you all, I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night now. Come with me.
a fantasy See the train.